here, people are talking about an escalation, and Putin again is putting out, particularly in Russian state media, threats of escalation to a nuclear level. But how much of this is propaganda and power projection, or how seriously should we take these threats? Well, there are two very different things to bear in mind. One is Russia's actual nuclear doctrine for when they would use nuclear weapons. And that, of course, is very different from when a Western power would do it. And it's much more a, an operational decision based on military terms than a strategic political one, as it would be in the West. But then there's the completely different question of, as you put it, the tactical propaganda, the rhetoric that we hear from President Putin, from Russian state television, making these nuclear threats. And the reason why they are so effective is that everybody forgets that they're an absolutely standard part of Russian rhetoric that we've been hearing for years, in fact, decades. Russia doesn't need to be at war to be saying this kind of stuff. And they build on a long and very consistent program of Russia trying to whip up fears of escalation in the West that's been going on for far longer than the war itself. The network of propagandists and agents of influence and useful idiots that Russia uses to push its messages has been warning of escalation with exactly that same intent as they have now, to try to constrain the West, to try to give the impression that if you get in Russia's way, if you impede Russia trying to do what it wants anywhere in the world, then you're going to risk a conflict, and that conflict will inevitably escalate to nuclear war. Now, that message has got across so effectively that we hear decision makers in the West, including military service chiefs, echoing those exact same phrases all the time now. But that's because Russia has put so much hard work into making sure that that's the background against which people are hearing these threats now. Liz Truss, our foreign secretary, has said that this war could drag on for a decade. Is it time, perhaps, that NATO were to turn a deaf ear, say, to the Kremlin's rhetoric and, and actually amplify their retaliation and, and do more, essentially, whether it be indirectly via tooling up Ukraine or perhaps even taking further steps and, 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 and committing, perhaps, to some form of aggression? Well, there's a very big difference between supporting Ukraine in helping it win this war on its own and actually getting involved. And that is the line that has been drawn relatively sensibly by Western politicians. Of course, the time in which to make that decision was before the invasion. And that's the time when the US, the UK, Canada actually pulled their troops out of Western Ukraine, where they're on training missions, in order that they didn't get in the way of the Russian invasion. And there can't have been a clearer red, green light to President Putin than that. And all of it was about how do we not get involved in this conflict, which was effectively leaving Ukraine on its own. Now that Liz Truss and other Western politicians have realized the implications of that, and the realization has sunk in that Ukraine is not the issue here. Ukraine is just the focal point of this broader war by Russia against the West. What we're hearing now from herself, from uh, the US Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, about how this war needs to end is really based on a recognition of what it really means and the long-term prospects, not just for Ukraine winning or losing, but actually for the future security of the whole of Europe. I mean, the difficulty is, of course, the longer this conflict drags on, the more that sanctions are going to bite not only Russia, but have uh, an impact back in Europe as well. We've, we're already in an energy crisis, which is continuing to escalate. How do you see this playing out? Is it going to be that it will splutter to a, 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 a demise when Putin runs out of money? Or is he going to do something along the lines of uh, what Ben Wallace has said and potentially strike and strike big so it looks like he's garnered some kind of scalp? Yes, when we're talking about a war of attrition, it's not just military attrition, it's also the economies of both sides. And let's not forget that Ukraine needs economic support as well, because its infrastructure is being consistently hammered by Russian airstrikes and missiles. Its exports have been interdicted by a Russian block sea blockade. And all of this will mean that Ukraine needs help in actually continuing to function as a state. And Russia can drive itself into the ground, as it's done so many times before, in pursuit of an unwinnable war for far longer than its adversaries can. And that, in effect, is how Russia wins its wars in the long term, by grinding them down. But Europe is also feeling the results now of the decisions about the balance of costs that it's taken over decades, deciding that it didn't need to invest in defending itself and taking on the risk of the much higher costs of a broader war later on. So it's now a case of playing catch up and realizing that those costs have been are now coming home to roost, that Europe is now paying the price of its dependence, for example, on Russian energy and its failure to take an interest in the real implications of Russian behavior and what that 
meant for Europe preparing to defend itself. Keir, fantastic having you back on the programme. That's Keir Giles from Chatham House. Well, we can speak now to former Royal Marines commando and filmmaker Emil Gessen, who is in Ukraine covering the conflict. Great to have you back on the show as well, Emil. Um, Hello. We saw yesterday, didn't we, after a period of relative calm, Kiev being struck once again by Russia as the US Secretary General was there. What is the mood on the ground now in the capital? Life was almost getting back to some semblance of normality. Yeah, the war is, it, it's only been a couple of weeks since Ukraine was under attack heavily from the north through areas like Irpin and Bucha as the Russians pushed away. So really, the mood within Kiev is that people, going back to normal, like you're saying, to a certain degree, but everyone knows the war's still ongoing. Um, the missile strikes yesterday were an eye-opener for many people. So many people have returned to the city to get on with life as much as they can. But it was an eye-opener to say, right, Russia can still strike, even though they're not on the gates of Kiev at the moment. Now, there's been news out about two Brits feared captured by Russian forces. The understanding is that they were probably there to try and provide independent humanitarian assistance, not part of any organisation. Uh, what is your awareness of other foreign nationals doing that sort of thing and the risk potentially that it poses to themselves, but also the risk that that could pose to the wider theatre of war if Russian troops are under the impression that we actually have foreign fighters on the ground? Yeah, Russia is fully aware. There was a British uh, former soldier who was a volunteer fighter that was killed yesterday, a guy called Scott. There's also, like you mentioned, the two humanitarian aids men that have been captured down in the southeast have been held by the Russians. I know a group of journalists that a month ago ran into a group of Russians, Chechens on a checkpoint, and they checked their ID cards, their passports, and sent them back on their way. So the fact is that the Russians have taken two humanitarian people here is an eye-opener it's, it's alerting for especially for the uk government to say right we've got two men that have been captured that were actually in prison um by the russians now we've got two men humanitarian aids workers are now being taken so for politically for the uk it's not good being in the being in a line like this but russia is fully aware that there are several hundred volunteer fighters from the uk that are currently here in ukraine fighting Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.